It's Michael Moulton, M2 The Rock, coming to you from Dallas, Texas, D-Town. Man, we got one today. We, you already see his face. He's the most recognizable, the official doctor, therapist, PhD of M2 The Rock. And I, for all my followers and people who have been watching, I've been very open about my experience uh, with Dr. Rob Kelly, uh, neuroscience and positive psychology coaching mental wellness, business success, trauma, childhood trauma, family systems coaching. And I like how at the end, addiction and alcoholism. And when I read that for the first time, um, it's at the end because if I don't address all the things above, then the addiction and alcoholism become the symptom. And I think the solutions to make these problems go away. Dr. Kelly, good to see you, my friend. Thank you, Michael. Great to see you again. Hey, guys, sit down. It's going to be a great one today. Absolutely. Educational. Make sure you subscribe. And, and um, under Dr. Kelly's name, you'll see his uh, website domain where you can go visit him and follow him on all his social media platforms and um, message him or call him anytime you need. Um, but I really enjoyed the last six days down in San Antonio uh, working with you, uh, very intense, very intense. And we're going to get into that today. But, you know, a lot of people um, talk about therapy and having a therapist. And, you know, some people don't want to admit it. And then when some people are nudged, maybe you ought to go see a therapist to talk about what you're going through. Um, it's valid. And I'm here to say that it's working for me. I mean, it is really helping me. Um, and then when things happen that make me uncomfortable, as a result of your coaching and counseling and guidance, um, I'm able to see it differently and handle it differently. And I'm really excited about that. And I appreciate you, Dr. Kelly. And I pre appreciate what you do for a lot of people. Uh, but here's a question I want to ask you to start the show off is, how do I find a good therapist? You know, for people who can't work with Dr. Kelly and, you know, there are, there are good therapists out there and then there are not good therapists out there, just like any business. But, how do I do this? I mean, what questions do I ask and, and how do I get with the right therapist? So the, the best thing to do is look at what you're suffering from. If it's depression or alcoholism or, you know, whatever the, whatever the, the problem is you're going through, lack of confidence, childhood trauma, uh, make sure, first of all, that you choose the therapist that's been through what you've been through. Very important, guys. And secondly, go see three. Don't just see one and go, okay, this is go see three different therapists. Check in with them for 30 minutes. Uh, some do it free, 30 minute uh, uh, quick uh, get to know each other uh, and find out if you uh, relate to that guy. If you bond with that guy or girl and they've been through uh, the stuff you've been through. You see, the, the problem with, like you just said, Michael, there's great therapies out there, there's great treatment centers out there, uh, but unfortunately about 90% are not. And if you're gonna moan and, and on the radio, oh, yeah, yeah, that's for you. 10% never more, you just know it's them that are doing the great work, um, is you've got to make sure that you gel. You can go to college for 10 years, learn about alcoholism or addiction. Uh, that doesn't give you the qualifications, PhD or not, to work with the person that's suffering from that. Now, any other illness, you don't have to suffer from depression to treat depression, but addiction and alcoholism, totally different. Yeah? The mind is completely different. Three parts of the brain that differ from anyone else in the world. So you've got to make sure that it's a fit for you. So contact free, go see them. I see a therapist every month. I see her once a month. Um, and this is how I found my therapist. I couldn't just walk into anywhere because everyone knows who I am. I wanted to keep it secret because I needed someone to talk to. So I, I booked three. I went into the first one and he introduced himself and I said, I suffer from alcoholism and addiction, or I did do, uh, can you relate to that? And he said, oh, I've never been through it myself, but my father did. It's like, ah, I'm good. I, I, and he said, wait, 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 I've been to college for five years. I have a master's in addiction counseling. So I said to him, okay, well, if, I, if you have a bottle of vodka behind your back and I had a knife, would you understand why I would repeatedly stab you in the face until I got that bottle of vodka off you? Well, Michael, he freaked out. Oh, hang on, I said, you're not for me. Went out, second one's just the same. You know, they freaked out. Got to the third one, which happened to be 80 year old ex heroin addict. She had long dreadlocks and she, you know, she'd aged pretty good for what she'd been through. And I told her this story about 
being very violent with this knife. And she turned around and said to me, oh, oh, oh no, I'd stab you first so I could drink the alcohol. That's my therapist right there. So it's important that you bond. They know what you're going through. They've been through it before. Also, they have the education. Coach, there's some great coaches out there, guys, but just be careful. You don't have to have qualifications in coaching world. In fact, Texas doesn't require them yet. But, you know, something, a diploma, something, uh, experience, something where you can relate will be the perfect person for you. And is it important that a man works with a man and a woman works with a woman, or does that matter? That's a myth going back to the old greedy days of AA. I think yeah. now it doesn't make any difference. I mean, unless you've got something really intimate that you feel uncomfortable. It's like, say it's a guy uh, telling a woman, and obviously your choice is a man, but it, it makes no difference. I get on, uh, I get on, would you believe I'm 63 in a couple of weeks' time? My, my prime patient age is 16 to 22. That's mm. where I get on with most. Um, because they, they, they obviously, you know, look up to me a little bit and they can relate. And I, I talk to them as they wanted to be talked to, not from a, uh, a higher person or professional person. You know, I always try to go down or go up to their level, whatever it may be, to make sure I communicate. So, yeah, that came from sponsoring, I think, unfortunately. Um, I, I don't agree with that. I sponsored many women in my life as well as many men. I just think it was a fit for you. Go for it, man. And so and, and is the client protected? I mean, if, if, if they take that risk and they open up and, and they're sharing uh, these, uh, you know, what they think are dark secrets. Um, and when they share that, are they protected that that doesn't go anywhere? <clears throat> if you're a licensed therapist, then the HIPAA regulations prohibit you uh, telling anybody or starting gossip or anything like that. If you go to a psychologist, a licensed psychologist or psychiatrist, they're the same. Nothing could come out unless you have murdered somebody mm -hmm. or manslaughter, then they have to tell the police. So you are HIPAA, uh, under HIPAA uh, regulations until one of them HIPAA rules, it's best just go on the internet and find out what they are. If you violate one of them rules, then like if you, if you went and it's all in confidence, but you told your therapist, licensed therapist, where everything is uh, confidential, not even the police can get them records without a warrant, um, if you tell them that you want to be make sure that you're in the right environment, coaches are not in that realm. Okay. So if you get a confidential with a coach, uh, and, and he spreads the rumor, there's nothing you can do about it because they're not right. licensed or regulated right now. So again, I have some serious stuff to tell, you know, some people, uh, when I was a licensed psychologist told me some stuff that was just absolutely mind blowing, but it was safe. Unless the police came to my door with a, with a search warrant, they weren't getting my records on nobody because we're protected like that. Interesting. Interesting. And, and it brings up a good point. What is the difference real quick between um, uh, Dr. Rob Kelly, PhD, and a psychiatrist? What are the two differences? Well, a psychiatrist, I'm a psychologist, a PhD psychologist. A psychiatrist can prescribe medication. That's about it. So many years ago, when you went to psychiatry, you'd sit there for the full hour discussing stuff and he would talk to you and you do the same as a probably highly qualified therapist, but they can prescribe medication. That's the only difference from psychologist to psychiatrist. Guys, if you're listening to psychiatry, I don't mean anything bad about this or disrespect to you guys, but basically that's what that is. Unfortunately today though, most uh, psychiatrists will give you 10 minutes and they probably won't even look you in the eye and they'll get you out of that room as quick as possible with a prescription in your hand. One, because they're overloaded with work, and two, because certain uh, psychiatrists, doctors have paid large amounts of money to push certain kind of drugs. It's why Adderall became so, so, so effective, because they were yeah. at people pushing that stuff, you know, painkillers and stuff like that. So, yeah, that, that's, uh, that's about the only difference, I think. That's the difference. That the patient there. So, needs to know. So... Uh, I want to role play a little bit, Doc, and, you know, kind of, and, and, you know, for everybody watching, we are, Dr. Kelly and I are working on where you can, we're going to get behind the scenes and watch a session between Dr. Kelly and myself, but let's kind of role play, you know, when I work with you, uh, either via, via virtual or in person. And when I sit down, I love it. It's the initial check-in. So let's kind of, mm -hmm. let's kind of do that for a second here. So we're starting now and I sit down and turn loose, Doc. Yeah, what's your scale of 1 to 10 tonight, Dave, Michael? 1 being miserable and 10 being amazing. Where would you be on that scale? 
I'm about an eight today. Eight. So the question that has to be asked after that is what would make it a nine? Um, probably to get release of the fear that I am going through right now. And what fear would that be? Uh, it, it's basically. the, um, well, basically, you know, a lot of it is the fear of the unknown, the future. We have the book coming out, you know, oh my God, we got to do this. We got to plan, you know, the promotion tour, the book tour, you know, money and, and all this stuff. And, and I get way out there in my head and I get, you know, you know, really anxious. So that's, mm -hmm. that's the fear I'm struggling with. But just now I just got some relief sharing that with you. Yeah, you will. Once you start sharing, it's unbelievable. You know, we hold that anxiety behind. Um, it only serves us uh, in the wrong way, obviously. Uh, the next thing we go through is let's check in to see if you have any resentments. And so have you have any resentments today? Uh, today, I don't. I don't have any resentments. Um, I'm, in, I'm in a good place on that. And for those guys who don't know what resentments are, you'd be surprised who doesn't. If somebody's pissed you off or you pissed them off, it's the basic answer I can give you. Then it's kind of resentment. Get rid of that stuff. Uh, and fear as well. The same question. Do you have any fear today? Yeah. I, I, and right now it, I, it, that's subsided in the last, you know, two minutes. Brilliant. You know, I, I've released the power of it by sharing it. And that's why I love doing what we're doing because it gets me more centered. You know, <coughs> starting this, this interview out, I was in a lot of fear. I mean, I was thinking about other stuff other than this, <coughs> you know, right here, right now. Um, yeah. And, I, and I'm feeling a little better. Grateful. And, and give me three things you're grateful for, man. Well, I'm grateful for you. Um, you know, Thank I'm you. grateful. I'm grateful for, um, uh, for my fiance, Lee, truly grateful for what she does uh, for me. And I guess I'm grateful for my little dog, Foxy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Brilliant. And then obviously we'd go into some serious talk on, on trauma right. or what today's bringing, but that's basically well, one goes. thing that you, one thing that you said last time, I like that is, are you recognizing any self sabotage yes. behaviors? Yeah. And you know, that opened up a, a great uh, conversation that you and I had <clears throat> for the first time, you know, I said, I am, I, I'm recognizing some self sabotage behavior and I'm so grateful, you know, mm -hmm. that, um, that I recognized it and, and, and didn't want to go down that, that road again. Um, so the so self sabotaging question is always good. And I'll tell you why, because self sabotage is all about patterns. Now the definition of insanity, the true psychological definition of insanity is me not being able to see my own truth. So with what's going on in the world, I can't see that. It's like when you drink and you're the last to know, we don't see what's going on. So there are always patterns. The world, is, the world and life itself is about patterns of math. That's what it comes down to. So let's say somebody relapses on Monday. That's not when you relapse. You go back a week or even two weeks, three right. weeks to find out where that pattern changed. And you will always find a pattern that changes. You have to remember when people come to people like me, their pattern is self-sabotage and the brain, the basal ganglia, it's called, is set up to destroy after a certain amount of wins. So we get the wife back, get the kids back, get the job, and then bang, it jumps in and we self-sabotage. So it's really, really important that you realize that pattern, whether that be, you know, this is an easy one. You know, I get up in the morning, I go to work, I'm agitated. You know, the boss pisses me off, so I give him a piece of my mind. Stop. There's your relapse. Two or three days, four days later, when you're in the bar drinking that beer, going, what the hell just went on? Back to that point. Why was you pissed off? Oh, well, I was tired. Why was you tired? Why didn't sleep very Why do you sleep very well? Well, I went to bed late. It's all under your control. All under your control. So you can, as, as long as we recognize the pattern, we can change the self-sabotage way before it happens. And this is what people don't really understand is you can be and do anything you want to do with the power of the mind and the brain, mind over the brain, which is matter, mind over matter is where the same comes from. But you have to, you have to outthink the subconscious brain. So going back to that being pissed with the boss, there it is right there. You've got to understand that there it is, you know, because we, as human beings, we get complacent. So we, you know, we get the new car, we get the new job, but six months in, it's just, ah, whatever. Getting a new car, you drive to it, whatever. It's like, you would have given your right arm for that car 12 months ago. But we get in that complacency. Once we're in that complacency, we miss the pattern change. 
Now that might be blatant or slight, but we miss that pattern. So we had a patient over in Highland Park, we were there in the medical building, she came and uh, she used to be, a, she's an ex-model, so she obviously cared for what she needs. Anyway, my, my staff who was taking her out for the day called in and said, hey, she wants to go to McDonald's. And I said, search your bag. So we asked the pay, can I search your bag? Oh, I, I don't know, I don't know. Found out there's half a bottle of vodka in that bag that she planned on drinking later on when she dropped her off back at the uh, halfway house. So that's mm. the kind of patterns we're looking for. That's a blatant one, but basically, right. you know what I mean? Why do we self-sabotage? I mean, let me, let me put it this way. Why was I self-sabotaging myself now that you know me so well? Uh, childhood trauma. The gateway drug is childhood trauma and trauma that relates from that. So, childhood, oh, so this happened to me, but it doesn't bother me today. Well, let's look at what this is down here that happened. Well, my mom and dad split up. Okay. Uh, uh, did you struggle with relationships? Go, well, yeah. Well, I mean, that's obviously nothing to do with my mom and dad. It wasn't really. Did you do this, this, this? Oh, my God, I did. Right? And we got back. I mean, it's not rocket science. Well, we've, searched, we've been researching for 20 years, pretending to the neuroscience behind all of this. But when you understand what's going on, it's not, it's not rocket science to understand it our child of what we're told as a child, okay, uh, and how our, our uh, eating and, and learning and sleep, it all comes from our parents teaching us the basal ganglia to repetition strength that confirms of something. But as, as a toddlers, mom says, don't put your hand on the hot stove. We try it, ah, we start crying. So we believe that what mom tells us is the truth. So what people say to us is the truth. So when strangers tell us, we believe it's a bit of truth. Okay, that's what we hear. What we see is how we feel. So if I watch a sad movie, I might feel sad, happy movie. But what we don't see is what we're growing with child does is the irritation between mom and dad. The not speaking, uh, the verbal wars that you can hear in your bedroom. These are all things that we'll call abandonment and growing up will, will affect your relationships. Because if you see dad coming home four or five, six nights of the week, drunk, beating mom up, you think that's normal. So when you go through life and you start to get somewhere in life, uh, you will self-sabotage that because going back to child, childhood, that it doesn't feel like that. This is the way home is. What's the first thing people want to do when they get sick? Want to go home. I want to go home. I just want to go home. Well, for childhood trauma people, home is that violent house. Yeah. So anything else just seems unnatural. So we'll self-sabotage because the bottom line is we don't think we're worthy. We're never tall enough, blonde enough, thin enough, or rich enough. And we carry that from, from uh, childhood trauma that will never be anybody. So quickly, while we're on that, before your next question is this, guys, is if you don't think you amount to anything and everything you've tried, your mom and dad were right, you'll never amount to anything. I want to apologize to you because mm. someone has put that there. Babies are born with million dollar minds. Why the hell do we listen to 10 cent minds? I never understand that. Yeah. And, and the, you remind me of something that I, that I say a lot and, and quote a lot is that stop focusing on the addiction and start focusing on why the addiction, right? Yeah. And yeah. why the addiction. And for me, it's the trauma, the pain and the suffering. And as a result of working with you and this, this quote unquote, as you call breakthrough that <coughs> witnessed and I had, um, you know, what happened was, is I finally forgave myself. <laughs> Um, and I told myself that I love myself and that's where the suffering, uh, was released and the spirituality grew. Does that make sense, doc? Yeah, it does. Very, very important. We go it, back and it, look at that, you know? Yeah. And speaking of that, you know, one of the, one of the incredible products that you introduced to me that you have, um, you know, um, that you use is called 9D breath work. And, you know, you introduced it to me and kind of did, I kind of did a little eye roll. I thought that this was hocus pocus, witchcraft stuff. Um, but it has worked for me. And this last uh, time that we spent together, um, I had a major breakthrough on the, um, on the going down the, um, I can't remember the name of it, the ancestral, uh, you yeah. know, background, the timeline, uh, yes, exactly. or the ancestral family tree. Yes. You know, we went through that. And it was just unbelievable where I literally, you know, saw my mom and my dad and grandfather and grandmother. And, and on the other side, the grandfather that, that molested me. And they literally told me that we love you. You know, you're forgiven. Please forgive us. 
and it was, and they told me to love myself and it was, and you witnessed it. I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't drive home for an hour. I had to just sit with you and I couldn't talk. I was shaking. What is 9D and what happened to me? Well, what happens is very, very well, it's complicated to explain, but basically 9D is a breathwork aid uh, with subliminal messages and nine dimensional sound around you. And the idea is, is while the guy's talking to you and he's taking you back and he's taking you through some hard stuff or easy stuff, uh, the other subliminal messages behind that in nine dimensions, so it's all over the place, will start to re-engage with the conscious brain of telling them the truth, that you are worthy and you can do this. And it's, yeah. there's 22 programs on it and it's just, <clears throat> it transcends. It's, it's, it's unlike any other therapy that anybody else has been through, okay? So the emotional tensions and various parts of the bodies without realizing it are all, you know, going in different directions. What we do by this breathwork movement uh, is, is get awareness with the individuals about the emotional states that they're in and what they're going through. And it will draw you out in such a way that you have no choice, no choice but to heal. Okay? Mm -hmm. So the breathwork is, but some of it's not breathwork, so, you know, when we call it 90 breath work, it's kind of uh, a little bit, I call it that, but it's this much more than that. Oh yeah. It's being aware of who you are, where you can go, the troubles in the past, it walks you through everything, using the breath work so you're staying calm uh, as you go through it, but it is very, very, very emotional. And I yeah, know when you come in, it's not to me, because a HIPAA violation to, to describe your, the way you went through it, but if you want to share with people, it's, it's immense. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that, you know, what, it took me a long time to pull it together and I'm still processing, you know, something happened and, you know, I, I'm more, I'm already quiet, but I'm even more quiet, but it's different because I'm processing this out of body experience that I had and I just trying to put it into words. And, you know, I had a major <laughs> headache after it. Why did I have a headache? It's just the different directions and your pathways are setting yeah. and the effort it goes into it and the strain on the body, which obviously is the mind and the brain. And, and uh, it's crazy because the, the Dora, uh, which is the skin around the brain, the brain, the brain doesn't actually have any pain receptors in people think they do that. No, it doesn't. It's a myth. Uh, but it's the Dora outside that's been stretched, you know, or decreases around the whole experience as you go through it. So we, we end up with, with a headache. Of course, plenty of water and a little bit of rest will get rid of that, but it, it's really intense. It's not like, you know, normal breath work or a therapist taking you back to you. It's really intense and it becomes real. And it actually takes you back because you're wearing eye goggles, blackout uh, mask and these yeah. headphones. Like I say, it's nine dimensional. So it takes it's incredible you sound. Back right back to that psychological place where it all happened and and hurt you because you're right there you're not you're not as if you're normally doing breath work and you're watching you are right there and, and that's traumatic right why do i hold my breath why do i catch i've done it my whole life but now i'm more <laughs> focused on it but why do i hold my breath it's uh well a lot of it is anxiety uh, we, we do that. It's like, guys, if you ever taken a cold bath or an ice bath that's going around right now, when you get in it, you stop breathing because the rest of the mind is going straight to the cold area. Quick, quick, let's flush it, let's flush it. It's freezing, we're going to freeze it there. And we, <sighs> and we tend to do that. We do that in life when, when stress and anxiety takes over. Uh, it really is sometimes a conscious effort to breathe. It's not natural in 100% of cases throughout your life. There are pints when the brain will be stressed like bang with something you didn't realize and you find yourself holding your breath or you drop into that future of what if what if and then the anxiety is and you you tend to hold your breath incredible you know and and how important doc is i just thought of this how important is it you know for family members or a husband or a wife that their loved one is really leaning into therapy and and really <clears throat> you know, trying to get this, what role do they play? Do they need to be in therapy or what do they need to be doing? The mom, the dad, the husband, the wife. So what we found with our test trials researches is if we take a patient on, let's say it's the guy and he's suffering from alcoholism. It's always the easy one to explain. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, we, unless the wife comes on or girlfriend, we won't touch them. When the family, as in mom, dad, or if you're older, girlfriend, wife, husband, when they take part in this, and anybody over the age of 18 that lives in the household, the success rate jumps to 42% straight away. Straight right. away. And then we look at, well, I've been to family you know, nights at the treatment center. Uh, all you did is you went to the place, you, your husband sat in front of you, and you told everyone about, about the bad stuff he'd done in the past. That right. is not transitional family healing. That is not. you know, That's just bashing the dad again because he's done something wrong. And now. So that's what is imperative. We have turned down lots of people because the, the girlfriend or the wife have gone, well, it's not my problem. Well, actually it is. And I'll tell you why, Mrs. Is, is because if you think for a second that your husband's the only one that's going down this, you ask, ask me one thing. Why do you let your husband come home at least twice a week drunk and end up beating him in front of the children? Talk to me about that, mate. Yeah. And the tears come. And it's like, you know, we did our research and tests on a housewife in a dysfunctional alcoholic house where there's violence and five soldiers coming back from Afghanistan and the PTSD was exactly the same. Hmm. That's what people don't realize. That's interesting. You know, we, we um, that's really good stuff there because we like to, you know, talk to the loved ones and the family members because they literally say, well, what about us? I mean, he's yeah. getting well, he's on vacation or she's on vacation. You know, what about us sitting at home? And it's, um, and it's good that everybody's on the same page because that way we're not triggering one another and going right back down the same path again, you know? Yeah, the way, the way we explain it is you've got two houses, guys, okay? Let's say this is the dysfunctional house. Let's say, for instance, that you speak English, okay? What happens is recovery and, uh, you know, uh, growth and, and uh, childhood trauma has a different language. So we pick you out. We take you over here for 90 days and teach you how to speak German, for instance, so when we pick you up and place you back in the English speaking house, guess what's going to happen? You're going to start speaking English. So the idea is, is to take the patient, if it's telehealth, obviously psychologically, but we teach them both English. So when you drop back in, you're all on the same page, you're all talking the same language and the 42% increase straight away. That's why yeah. we have a 97% success rate straight away happens because everybody's on the same page. Well, and I like it makes sense on your success rate because you vet them properly up front saying, hey, this is a family deal. We're all going to do this. I don't care what you're going to pay me if we don't do it the way that I know that's going to work and it's proven. I can't work with you. And that's I can't pay this a- bill now for a million dollars. Uh, it was 16 years ago. So uh, Dallas Campisi's restaurant, they closed the whole restaurant off. She finished a, a performance at like 10 o'clock. She was supposed to be at the restaurant at 11 o'clock. They, they, they kept me there until 11.30 and she walked in and she was a bit worse for wear, if you know what I mean, guys. And I instantly stood up and I said, I can't help you. Walked towards the door. Her father, Jamie, I think it was, he stands up. He checks the checkbook out. He tears it off. He signs it and he pushes towards me and said, please write a million dollars on that. And I said, Jamie, I can't help her. She isn't ready. And I walked out. We have fired people for not doing as they're told. We have no refund. That's the biggest saying. You're going to refunds, you're in or you're not. So the vetting process is very strict. More people get turned down than actually get accepted by our program. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and this has been always been a bugbear of mine. When I start doing this for the money, all bets are off. I'm yeah. not going to be successful. Now, I know in the early days, it was hard to turn that million dollars down because I've been in the US about 12 months. You know, I mean, that would have been beautiful, but I wanted to stamp my mark on this is not about money, you know. And, and people see me today and you see the flash watches and cars and, you know, where we live and all that. And it's like, you have no idea what I do behind your back. You have no idea how much money we actually give away. You have right. no idea the time I give away to veterans and no idea the work we do. No idea. But what they see is this cocky guy, you know, with, you know, he's very ostentatious and he's flashy. And no, that's just I, the reason why I live like that is because I can. I mean, if. My dad always said, if you like a car and it's beautiful and it costs back in the day, it costs 20,000. Have you got the cash to pay for that 20,000? Because if you have, go buy the car. But if you haven't, don't go in debt for it. And that's what we live by today. Right. Know? And and I, I can't support you more because at, at first, you know, I, I, I thought it a little bit, but immediately getting to know you, your heart and your passion. And, you know, we cry together, we hug each other and 
Um, and it's, it's amazing. I want to share something that just hit me and then we'll get into our last couple of topics. I want to share something that happened to me this morning, Dr. Kelly. I started my exercise workout this morning, like I committed to, uh, with you with a trainer. And today was an introduction and the gentleman was just super awesome. He researched me and, you know, saw what he's getting into. And he was super excited. It was real <clears throat> spiritual. I could feel a really, I felt his spirit, just a good dude. And he said, today I'm gonna get to know your body and, you know, do some stretching and ask some questions. And he literally rubbed all over my body in different positions and all this stuff. And it was wonderful. Okay. Um, it was a great session. And as I was driving home, it hit me. Something happened. It was the very first time in my life that a, a male, don't even know him, touched me. And I didn't squirm. I didn't have flashbacks. Wow. It didn't trigger me. Because my whole life, I could yeah. never have a man touch me. Yeah. I could shake hands and do the buddy hug. Um, what happened? Well, I don't mean to blow my own horn, but get me the biggest trumpet ever over here. It's the work you're doing with us. He's taking you away from it. It is. Trumpet. That's exactly what it is. So here's, here's, what, here's how powerful that is. If, if a person sat down and struggling, and, and I always ask him, you know, can I put my arm around you? Is it okay if I touch you? Is it okay if I... And they go, yeah, of course. We'll just get through the session. And we get through. And they're struggling. I walk over. I place my hand on his shoulder, and I give him sub subliminal messages and encouragement, okay? Then I go and sit down. The next time he comes, he feels the same. All I've got to do is walk over and place my hand briefly on his shoulder and all the feelings of safe encouragement comes in. You see, 95% of communication is not verbal. <clears throat> so when we get into that, you know, it's uncomfortable to be took, your mindset has changed and your perspective on life has changed and you now start to realize who you are. So what you were is the people that, that uh, programmed you, the people that... Uh, led you up to this with all the shit that happened around you. We're living off what they said and what they did. And today, when it happens, it can feel very uncommon. So we don't go anywhere near it. You've shifted from being groomed, whatever that looks like. I don't mean sexually, but it can be yeah. groomed into this person that's dysfunctional. So you're finding out who you are and finding out that this is safe. This is good. I'm in control here. It feels amazing. And Validation and approval, if you don't get that from the parents, uh, anything less than nurturing is child abuse. If you don't get that from the parents, it will affect you going forward. Yeah. So that, that's great news. That's kind of made and, my day. And, 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 for, and I didn't do a lead in. It's for people who are watching this for the very first time. I am a, a survivor of, of, of sexual abuse uh, you know, by my grandfather and you know, uh, physical abuse by my father. And, and so I could never let even a man cut my hair. I mean, you know, Leo said, Hey, let's go get a massage. And I'm like, no, I mean, nothing. Yeah. <clears throat> and this was just so natural and I felt so safe and I didn't even realize it until I was driving home. I'm like going, I didn't get the hibby jibbies. Cause I would say, stop, get off yeah. me, get away from me. Yeah. And it was just such another breakthrough as a result of working with you and, and, um, finding myself, you know, and, that, yeah, and, that's what, and I've got to say now on air, guys, that when Michael came to us, he was a stud. He really was, but there were certain parts missing. What you yeah. are today going forward is almost unrecognizable when it comes to behavioral science and it also becomes to the psychology behind what we're doing. It's like you have done a 180 round and you, mm. you know, will be very successful, more successful than you are now. Uh, you're going to help millions, if not billions of people yeah, as we rocket you into this new life and we know we've got some exciting stuff coming up with you with the book and everything but yeah it's just you're you're one of my best patients right now who's turned around and done it you know it's been very challenging for both of us sometimes and frustrating you know for you when i ask the questions or you you don't do something i ask or i can't even think of a time when we did that but there was yeah. you know there was kind of a i don't believe this guy like most people do and then all of a sudden from the first session you click right in and you put right. all your faith in me, which is huge, huge, you right. know, for our relationship. So thank you. For and you, that. yeah, and thank you. And you hold me accountable. And 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 also, it takes two. You know, for the people watching this, and if you're <coughs> if you're going to therapy and you you work with Dr. Rob Kelly or you work with a therapist that that you feel safe with, you got to be vulnerable and you yes. got to be transparent. And the more <coughs> you put into it, 
um, um, the more you're going to get out of it. Uh, Doc, um, we'll end with this. You know, I have a good friend of mine and, you know, without mentioning names, he's, he's incredible person, you know, very strong in faith, helps a lot of people. Um, he's been clean for over 14 years. You know, I grew up with this guy and he leans on me and, you know, but he struggles with anxiety and panic attacks, mm. tightness in his chest where he can't breathe. Um, <clears throat> and I wanted to bring this up, you know, because he's not the only one, because I hear this from a lot of people and I used to, you know, struggle with that. So let's break it down as far as, um, what is this tightness in this, our chest that we're feeling and what is anxiety? Anxiety itself is, is okay. So listen to this guys very carefully in a basic layman term, anxiety is worrying about what's happening in the future. It's called the unknown. So we worry about that. We get anxious, heartbeat changes, our muscles cramp, and, and then we feel all, all tight in our chest. Now what causes anxiety? Well, here's how it starts. So my mom had anxiety, so I've got anxiety. My mom had heart problems, so I have heart problems. There's only one disease you can pass down, that's alcoholism. There's a predisposition and a generational attached to alcoholism, not addiction, not drug addiction, just alcoholism. But what happens is the family, say you were born into this family that has a staple of food. Let's say, for instance, it's red meat and it's potatoes and you grow up on that all your life. One of the reasons why father is suffering from inflammation is he can't properly methylate that red meat. So with him not being able to methylate the red meat, it causes a deficiency. Now, way before when there's no vitamins, they're allowed to take uh, the deficiency caused the inflammation. So when we get it, we go, oh, I passed down from death. No, when you leave, you might carry that mismethylation around red meat, but because you like steak, you go out. So therefore you have the deficiency and therefore you have, you know, the inflammation of, of, of your body. That's what it is. And it also could cause anxiety. So if you're, if you find out what you can't methylate, MT, HR, uh, blood test, don't get it done guys, cause for $400, it's well worth it. And you replace with uh, organic multivitamins. You gotta be careful with multivitamins guys. So when you go in and you see these nice shiny multivitamins for these companies that you trust, spin it around, look what's on the back. Cybo, Cybamalin, I think it's called, is cyanide. So look for all smart words, get the organic version, vitamins down you, proper exercise, the breath work, the presence of oxygen equals the lack of disease. Every disease grows in a hypoxic area of the body. Then you can have the full nutrients. You've got the endorphins, dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin flowing every single day. And you start and a step up to being the best person you could ever be. So different forms of anxiety, different causes, but when you're eating well, um, and you are, you know, exercising and, and, and you get a focus, like five things to do today, you know, and you get like a routine in your life, the anxiety will disappear. Mm. It will disappear rather than going to the doctor and getting on medication for the rest of your life. Now you're stuck on that medication. It goes up to a hundred thousand. A pill, you're still stuck with that medication because it gives you a false sense of serotonin uh, or whatever it is, a false uh, chemical in, in the mind and uh, on the brain. And, uh, we cannot, uh, like our serotonin can't go over a false serotonin. So right. we take a pill for a false serotonin, we're stuck on that. So right. our own serotonin can't break through that. So what happens is we do this with our serotonin and this is, this is for life. Now we, we can't manage without these pills. Why isn't anybody asking why my serotonin is low in the first place? Why isn't anybody asking why I have anxiety and what is it about? Is it about the future? Is it something I can't control? Mm -hmm. And then is it a deficiency with the food that I'm eating? I like what you said. We started the show out with, you know, some struggle with some fear and anxiety. And I love it because it's <clears throat> lack of structure and routine. You yes. know, when I, when I have structure <clears throat> and routine in my life, there's no anxiety, you know, no. I know where I'm going and I, I, I'm in the now. That's beautiful. Let's say, you know, panic attack. What is a panic attack? And, and, and I mean, how do I avoid it? Is that just anxiety on steroids? Yeah, that's all it is. And, and, it, and it mimics certain parts. And it also comes very, very quickly, but can go very, very quickly. And it's again, it's the inability to manage one's moment or one day, one's day. That's what it comes down to. You have to be able to manage that day, take charge of that day and focus what you are going to do that day. So write five things down in the morning, guys, you're going to complete. You might complete a hundred, then five things you put down, they have to be complete. 
wash the dishes, walk the dog, whatever silly they may be, you have to. Once you do that, you have a routine. Once you have a routine, you have a plan. Once you have a plan, everything seems to calm because now you know what you're doing. How can there be fear about the future when you've got it in black and white that this is what I'm going to do today? You know, yeah. future down there, if I'm concentrating on today, is the minimus. It doesn't exist. Yeah. Now we have to plan for vacation. That's great. But once we get in that day, our mind doesn't wander. We don't get panic attacks and we don't get anxiety. And before you jump up screaming at the screen, guys, go do your homework around that. Myself or Gary Brecker will, will demonstrate online of what this is all about. It's not about the medical fraternity. You don't have to keep going to the, to the uh, pharmaceutical companies for relief, guys. Don't believe everything your doctor tells you. I will never, by the way, go to a doctor for my general health ever again. Ever. Yeah, you say that all the time. Bag, I've got to go. Never. From my general health, and there's the, the food companies get us sick, okay? The medical fraternity dish out the pharmaceutical drugs, and that's how the world is made and run. Beautiful. Nobody Beautiful. wants you well, guys, okay? Nobody wants you well. Oh, yeah, that's wrong, really. Go find, go find organic, clean food from Whole Foods and then put it next to a price from an old supermarket, the same things. It costs money to eat well. It should be the other way around. But we'll follow sugars, we'll follow all sorts of nasty red colors, yellow colors, you know, that they're giving us every single day. Like there's 22 items in HEB right now I can take you to that's banned in 27 other countries because wow. of the effects of causing cancers, of messing with the mind, or all sorts of stuff, but they're still being used. Fruit Loops is one of those. If you don't, whatever you, if your kid loves Fruit Loops, don't lock on the back of that box. Do not, it'll scare the shit out of you if you lock <laughs> at what you're feeding your kid. Because there right. will be flowers off that. Wow. Well, Doc, you got some big stuff coming up. What do you got coming on? You got um, you got the um, the Neuro uh, Realty Conference. So we got the Neuro Realty Conference going on. It's uh, I think it's uh, Friday next Friday, and we'll put all this in the description below. Yeah. So we're teaching realtors how to become millionaires, um, and then we have obviously the old English tea shop doing really good next to our headquarters and office. Oh, it's so good. Going off. Uh, then I go to England for 10 days. Can't miss that out. And then we have the Rob Kelly Foundation.org. That's the only thing I will push. Uh, it, we just started a 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, your donations as well, except we help people. You don't have to be an alcoholic. We help people, but we're different. So let's say you donate $10 and we say thank you very much. We don't take a dollar out of that for our services. That $10, and it's traceable, we'll show you, that $10 might go to someone else's money that goes to buy him a suit to turn up in court mm. on Friday to win his kids back for the weekend. You will get an email from that guy thanking you for your $10 and telling you what he put it towards and the outcome because of that. That's the difference. It's a lot more That's work, but we, none of us get paid. No one gets paid in a nonprofit. It's all done from the goodness of our heart, period. Beautiful. RobKelly.com. That's R-O-B-B-K-E-L-L-Y.com. Uh, go there and visit his website and um, you can contact him there. He's got an incredible team with uh, Courtney, Ashley, and the boss lady, Janet, <laughs> Janet, and the two dogs. And so um, Dr. Kelly, once again, um, the official uh, therapist, Dr. PhD of M2 The Rock, you have mean, meant so much to myself and Lee and everything that you're doing uh, to help us and, and to, um, to help me to keep sharing um, how I'm growing uh, to uh, let people know, give them hope. It's that simple to provide hope, you know, for the hopeless. And um, I really appreciate you coming on today and look forward to seeing you. And from all of us here at M2 The Rock, I got three words. It's got eight letters. And it's got one meaning. I love you. <laughs>